Hello everyone, welcome to another shocking episode of La Criminotica, the series where we explore the most fascinating and disturbing criminal cases. If you are passionate about the world of criminology, you are in the right place. But before we start, if you don't want to miss any future episodes, make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications. Today we will delve into a case that shook Spanish society at the dawn of the 21st century, one that even today, more than two decades later, continues to be the subject of debate and speculation. We are talking about the case of Pietro Arcan Petro, better known as, the Assassin of Pozuelo. For context, in the early hours of June 20, 2001, in the quiet town of Pozuelo de Alarcón in Madrid, the Castillo family suffered a devastating attack in their own home. Arturo Castillo López, a 47-year-old lawyer with a distinguished career in the national court, was brutally murdered in his own bed. His wife and his daughters were not spared from the horror, they were also attacked with a violence that surpasses all human comprehension. Initially, the motive for the crime seemed clear, a robbery gone horribly wrong. However, the extreme cruelty and treachery with which the act was committed raises uncomfortable questions. Was it really a robbery or are we looking at something more complex like a contract killing? Castillo himself, apparently, specialized in defending alleged Russian mobsters. He had contacts with characters who, to say the least, moved in shadowy circles. And let's not forget that, weeks before the incident, an intruder had already been detected in his garage, eluding the police. The case was resolved quickly and Petro was arrested the same day as the crime. Sentenced to 75 years in prison in 2003, the story could have ended there. But doubts persist. And today, in this episode, we're going to try to unravel the complexities of this case, examine the evidence, and evaluate the theories. Are we looking at a thief who, when caught, became a ruthless killer? Or is there more to this story still waiting to be discovered? So fasten your seatbelts because this episode promises to be a ride full of intrigue, mystery, and chilling twists in the narrative that will make you question everything you think you know about crime and human nature. We begin. Pietro Arcan Petro. The Pozuelo Murderer. Classification, Assassin. Features, Robberies, the murderer attacked the wife and two daughters of the deceased. Number of victims, one or more. Date of crime, June 20, 2001. Date of arrest, June 20, 2001. Date of birth, October 9, 1977. Victim, Arturo Castillo Lopez, 47 years old. Method of crime, firearm, beatings, stabbing with a machete. Location, Pozuelo de Alarcón, Madrid, Spain. Status, sentenced to 75 years in prison on July 28, 2003. Murder for hire or robbery. June 21, 2001. Questions arise in the face of Pozuelo's horror, although some issues of the drama that destroyed the Castillo family begin to be revealed. The government delegate, Francisco Javier Answategui, asserted yesterday that the motive for the carnage was robbery, and that the murderer entered the chalet alone. At first, it seems to us that he went in to steal and, when he was surprised, he went crazy and did what we know, he said. The police headquarters confirmed the hypothesis, supported, according to its spokespersons, by the testimony of the couple's daughters, who only saw one man, and by the visual inspection. However, at first it was indicated that two or more individuals could have participated in the assault. It is confirmed that it was a robbery. The detainee has numerous antecedents of these characteristics, commented a source in the investigation. In addition, the officials found Arkin a bag with 19,000 pesetas and jewelry, property of Castillo's wife. But the cruelty and treachery with which the alleged robbery ended makes the investigators consider other hypotheses, such as the settling of scores. Lawyer Arturo Castillo Lopez was known and respected in the profession. 
In the third section of the National Court, he handled extradition cases and lately specialized in the defense of alleged Russian mobsters. Two weeks ago he had carried out the extradition of a subject from that country. Sources consulted do not rule out a crime for hire. Castillo also intervened in the extradition of financier Angel Rodriguez, El Divino, known as the Mexican Mario Conde. At number 22, Calle Covarrubias, where he shared an office with his brother Angel Luis and his sister-in-law Adela Aldana, everyone agrees that the business was working very well. Arturo processed civil, matrimonial, criminal and commercial matters. Sources close to the victim expressed that he never received threats. However, according to family neighbors, about 20 days ago his service employee found a stranger inside the chalet's garage around 10 in the morning. The man managed to escape while they alerted the police. Arturo Castillo was a golf fan. Last year he won the award from the Madrid Bar Association in this sport. He liked to spend time in an apartment on the Porta de la Duquesa golf course, Malaga, which, curiously, was also robbed three years ago. The police confirmed that the perpetrator of the murder of the lawyer and the attacks on his family acted alone. June 22, 2001 The tests carried out at the scene of the crime committed on Wednesday in a chalet in Pozuelo de Alarcón by the scientific police confirmed that only one person was involved in the events. At 4.20 a.m. the police received a distress call from a woman from a chalet. Upon her arrival, the agents discovered that her husband had been stabbed to death and had his throat cut, she herself had been shot twice in the abdomen, one of the daughters had been sexually assaulted and the other had a deep cut on her neck. The fatal victim is Arturo Castillo, a 47-year-old lawyer. The event occurred on Calle de la Arquitectura, at number 117, a quiet residential area that has become the scene of a horrifying event. Once the tests carried out by the scientific police specialists have been carried out, including fingerprinting at the scene, the investigation confirms that a single person was the perpetrator of the murder of the lawyer and the injuries suffered by his wife and two daughters. In addition, they stated that they only saw one person in the house and have photographically identified the detainee as the person who entered the chalet. Apparently, no doors were forced, although the home was accessible from one of the front windows. The woman, Angela S.P., 44, made a first call to the emergency services at 4.20 a.m. to report that someone had entered her house. On the second call, Angela could only say that she was injured, that her husband was dying and that her daughters were also in the house. After half an hour of anguish, at 4.50 a.m., the woman called the police again to say that she heard the police outside the house and that she could not open the door because she was injured. Once at the home, the aggressor delivered two fatal stab wounds to the lawyer, in the chest and neck, which caused his death. The murderer was cruel to the man, since his body had several cuts and two gunshot wounds. The couple was in his bedroom at that time. The woman was shot twice. One of them entered through her left buttock and exited through her abdomen, which left her badly injured. Subsequently, she was transferred in very serious condition to the clinical hospital, where she underwent surgery. One daughter sexually assaulted and another injured. The two daughters of the couple have not escaped and escaped either. The assailant tried to slit the throat of one of them, aged 17, who was injured with a cut on the neck. The other daughter, 15 years old, was sexually assaulted, as confirmed by the General Directorate of Police. The two young women were transferred to the Madrid Hospital in La Paz, where they were released a few hours later. One of the police vehicles that went to Pozuelo came across the alleged attacker, who was fleeing the chalet on foot at the time. The detained assailant, a Moldovan national, fired at the agents and managed to flee at first. However, the police managed to arrest him at 6.15 a.m. On a pedestrian walkway that crosses the La Coruña Highway, in front of the Hypercore shopping center. 
The agents found the attacker's bag in which they found a gun and the blue t-shirt that he was wearing during the shootout with the police. In that bag he also carried various items, such as jewelry, as well as an amount of money. The two miners recognized the jewelry, the bag and the amount of money that one of them had in the house. However, the investigators do not explain the cruelty with the victims. The mortal remains of lawyer Arturo Castillo Lopez were buried yesterday afternoon in the Sacramento de San Justo Cemetery in the capital. According to sources from the Forensic Anatomical Institute, the lawyer's mortal remains were transferred from those offices, where the autopsy was performed, at 4.30 p.m. to be buried at 5 p.m. In the aforementioned cemetery, the Unified Police Union SUP, has stated that Pozuelo is a town with a large number of urbanizations and separated by a considerable distance, in which it would be necessary to at least triple the number of police officers serving at night, six cars. Instead of two, to guarantee a police response to any emergency in a time close to five minutes. The Chalet Killer June 24, 2001 Look into his eyes. If you are a good journalist you will be able to see in his mugshot photo what kind of man he is. It's cold, very cold. I can't get another word out. Marshall 2. He looks like a soldier, he doesn't flinch, he knows where he is and how to behave. He only speaks to ask for tobacco or to be taken to urinate. Between the four walls of the cell at the Pozuelo de Alarcón police station, Madrid, with a cement bed with a soft mat for all the furniture in the nine square meters of cage, Petru Arkin does not show any signs of disturbance. Sometimes he walks, other times he lies on the pallet. Standing on flip-flops that peek out from under his sweatpants, his 1.85-meter wingspan gives the 23-year-old Moldovan's muscular body the appearance of an athlete. Nor does the icy look of his green eyes, which is lost over the walls and ceiling painted in a stain-proof dark gray, reveal the cold-blooded crime that early Wednesday morning ended with a lawyer's throat slit, his wife seriously wounded by a gunshot. One daughter of the couple with a cut on her neck and the other, 15 years old, victim of sexual assault. And so much excessive cruelty for a loot of barely 19,000 pesetas and some jewelry. I'm fed up with Spain. This is a poor country where you can't steal properly. People who have money never keep it in their homes, he used to say to some fellow countrymen friends when he had only been in Spain for a few months. They met in November 1998 and began sharing a flat in a municipality on the outskirts of Madrid, Caslada. So Petru, Peter in Romanian, spoke Russian well, and Romanian with some difficulty. In Spanish he didn't know how to say hello or goodbye. What he was already a master at was surviving without bending his back. He was an immigrant like the others, but his dream was not to earn an honest living. Since he has never worked, he has always had the hands of a gentleman, his friends now remember for Kronika. He loved expensive perfumes, jewelry, gold and cars, especially the Volkswagen Passat. Spring 1999 A photograph, to which Arkin boastfully lent himself, and which accompanies these lines, portrays the thief willing to take matters into his own hands. For months now, Petru has begun to write, even in bloodless handwriting, an ambitious criminal record. The light enters from behind through the terrace of the 3D floor of No. 14, Peru Street, in Caslada. And there he is, alone, an apprentice to the ferocious Steppenwolf, the boy raised in an orphanage in Moldova, the guy who prided himself on having worked in Russia with the most powerful mafia in the world, the prison-hardened immigrant. According to himself, he boasted about his native Moldova and the Germany after the fall of the wall. Flirty, scrupulously shaven as always, he chose for the photograph a more informal outfit than the black suit, white shirt and dark tie that he had chosen for uniform. Yes, he liked to go like a real gangster. From the glasses to the gold chain that he wears, including the watch and the mobile phone, everything is left over from some of his last loot. 
Also the camera with which the snapshot was taken is the result of his escapades outside the law. I didn't have schedules. He stayed asleep when the rest of us went to work and often went out at night, without saying where. Nighttime absences sometimes lasted weeks. The Moldovan usually returned from them with televisions, records, sound systems and other valuables. Occasionally, at the wheel of a car, to which he changed registration in that, after using it for two or three days, he ended up abandoning it in some open field. His biggest secret was a black briefcase that he didn't allow anyone to touch. On one occasion, while covering his cleaning shift at the house, one of his co-workers tripped over his handbag. She was in the hallway and I pushed her aside. It weighed a lot. It was full of 500 peseta coins and watches. Also large was a ring that he wore on one of his hands, and whose origin he was never able to convincingly explain. He was very reserved. You never knew exactly what he was up to and you couldn't be sure that he was telling the truth either, that nickname, was sloppy. He often slept dressed and, according to his colleagues, he forgot to eat. He returned from his long absences dead of hunger. Then he would ask us for something or, if he had money, he would buy chicken, fish and chips, which drove him crazy. He didn't drink or take drugs. At most he would share a beer, although he did smoke at least a pack a day of imported blonde tobacco, LM or Marlboro. Robber with driver. In his most expansive moments, in the middle of 99, he even confided his working method to one of his friends from the apartment. He, he told me that he found out about some interesting house and then watched it for three or four nights, until he was sure that no one was inside. Once the objective was set, Arkin acted alone. He occasionally found himself a driver. If he needed the support of a car, he would take some kid from the neighborhood, 17 or 18 years old, and give him 15,000 pesetas to wait outside. For the room that he shared in the house on Peru Street, which has three, in addition to a kitchen, bathroom and living room, he religiously paid 8,000 pesetas. In May 1999 he stopped living there. Now, the name of the new tenants appears in the mailbox corresponding to the Caslada apartment. And the marriage of the Romanians Gabriela and Soren Pistoiu has a very good reputation in the neighborhood. They are hardworking and simple people who, after years of effort, own a small real estate renovation company. Since the collective of Romanians and Moldovans in the apartment was dissolved, Arkin has been known to other shared homes in Vicovaro and San Fernando de Henares. In Caslada it has been a long time since he stopped frequenting a central square, next to Avenida de la Constitución, where emigrants from eastern countries usually meet. He hung out with the worst, say those who knew him, and surely they made plans or sold the loot from robberies. Until one day, the Romanians beat him to death for messing with one of them. They beat him so much that he was in a coma. He survived. Last Wednesday morning, his stomach was empty again, as always on the eve of all the blows. After days of stalking the Bellas Arts Chalet neighborhood in Pozuelo de Alarcón, he knew how to enter number 117, Calle de la Arquitectura. He knew every nook and cranny of the estate in detail, and even as can be seen from the questions he later asked the family's two daughters, where is that good wine you have? He knew personal aspects of him such as his mother, Angela, a winemaker's love for good wines. A helpless family. A fateful mistake by the Castillo Sierra family, who forgot to activate the complex alarm system that protected the home, allied themselves with the Moldovan. Covered by night and equipped for the assault with a 15cm bladed machete and a revolver full of ammunition, Arkin slipped through the garden until he found an open window. No dogs barked, the family's two Rottweilers had been euthanized two years earlier, after they attacked the girls. In just over 20 minutes, after 4 in the morning, the Moldovan turned the home of lawyer Arturo Castillo into a butcher shop. 
The chronology of the events is limited by three telephone calls for help made to the Regional Emergency Service of the Community of Madrid by a terrified wife and mother. In the first SOS, at 4.16 a.m., Angela asked for police help because someone had entered the house. She called from the bedroom, where she was with her husband, and explained that the noises gave away the intruder. The conversation was cut off before the lawyer's wife spoke directly to the police. They were trapped. The panic button, a sophisticated security system the family had built into the house that alerts the police even if the alarm is turned off, was located on the lower floor, away from the bedroom area. The shots that preceded the lawyer's throat, and which left his wife badly injured on the same bed, occurred in the interval between that first call and the arrival of a patrol car at the door of the chalet. According to the police headquarters, it was just five minutes. According to the Unified Police Union, 15. While the agents, who from outside did not perceive any abnormality in the house and even rang the doorbell, surrounded the property, Arkin finished his work. Seized by what forensic experts call homicidal rage, the aggressor, enraged by his own actions, enters into a spiral of unlimited violence, he stabbed his 17-year-old daughter in the neck and sexually abused her. Small, 15. Then, after getting them to give him all the money they had, he left them locked in a closet located on the ground floor of the three that the chalet has. 22 minutes after her first call, Angela, who was bleeding to death from the bullet that pierced her abdomen, and whom Arkin must have believed dead after stabbing her husband, dialed the number 112 again. It was 4.38 a.m. The intruder, she insists, is still inside her. And she fears, with her husband lying limp next to her in the double bed, that she might do two of his little ones to her. Before the third call, at 4.47 a.m., I can't open the door for the police, let them come in even if it's just by knocking down the door, he exasperated, a succession of shots once again breaks the silence in the Madrid urbanization. Arkin, in his escape through the rear fence of the property, runs into the agents. But the Moldovan was not willing to let himself be hunted. He responded to the order to stop with a succession of shots. He was chased for an hour and a half first through an open field near the chalet neighborhood. The police force of local and national agents ended up cornering him on a bridge just over a kilometer from the scene. Before being captured, he got rid of a Lowy bag with a t-shirt, a revolver with all the bullets fired, the 19,000 pesetas and some jewelry. Born on October 9, 1977 in Gregoriapal, in Moldova, a country that until 1944 was part of Romania and then the Soviet Union, Arkin has never had papers that legalized his situation in Spain. In fact, there is not even absolute certainty about his name, which has successively changed to Pietro, Petre and Petrov. This week, before the police, he even pretended to be a certain Igor Dimitrascu. Since his arrival, which police sources placed six years ago, Although his first colleagues speak of 1998, the only official documents in which his name appears are reports of events or judicial proceedings. Since March 1999, the date of his first arrest, robbery of a vehicle, Arkin has left his criminal traces in at least four provinces, Toledo, Guadalajara, Zaragoza and Madrid. Several times during this time, his expulsion from Spain was processed, but the judges denied it alleging that he had pending matters with the courts. They have had some incidents in the neighborhood. They got kicked out of the Crim nightclub for organizing a fight. Apparently, Pietro said something to a girl and some Spaniards beat him up. Cata's jaw was broken. Since then, Romanians have been prohibited from entering. Despite Arkin's background, the residents of number 14, Calle de Peru in Caslada are surprised by what happened in Pozuelo. I couldn't imagine that he would be capable of doing such a thing with all that poor family, says a neighbor. All those consulted are convinced that Arkin did not act alone in the early hours of Wednesday. It is strange that he went there without a car and without anyone helping him escape, they say. 
These days I've thought a lot about whether it was Kata who was waiting for him outside, says the boy, lowering his voice. Arkin doesn't speak Spanish well. He made himself understood in English with the gang of 15-year-olds. We used to love smoking with him, because he always had Marlboros, says one girl. I never saw him with a joint, but I don't know if he took pills. When I think about what he has done I feel disgusted and scared. For us it was a terrible shock. When I saw the photo of him on television on Wednesday I said to myself, hell, I know that guy. No. Then I realized that he was the one in the third. Almost at the same time, Pietro appeared surrounded by policemen, to recognize his possible belongings in the house. It was a very strong impression to see him on television and five minutes later on the street when he already knew that he was a murderer. The Police Hypotheses In the surroundings of No. 117 on Calle de la Arquitectura, in Pozuelo, the police have not discovered any stolen car. Inside the chalet where Pietro Arkin allegedly murdered the lawyer Arturo Castillo, he seriously injured his wife, Angela, and attacked his daughters, there are only traces of the suspect. What we still don't know is if someone was waiting for him outside in a car and he got scared when he saw the agents, police sources say. Due to Arkin's escape route towards the Hypercore shopping center, we believe that he was trying to reach the rent stop, so it is possible that he arrived in the area by train. The last suburban train passes through Pozuelo at 11.35 p.m. and the first at 6.02 a.m. In between there is no service. The police do not rule out any working hypothesis, but for now they focus on the main one, that of the robbery. It was not an easily accessible home. He must have chosen it because it had two open windows, say police sources. The villa's sophisticated security system had been offline at dawn, but Arkin hadn't even tried to deactivate it. According to Carlos Juanes, director of Texager, the security company hired by the Castillos, the family was very aware and everyone knew how to set and remove the alarm. Juanes maintains that many people mistakenly believe that the greatest danger of assault lies on vacations or absences. A year ago, the alarm in the chalet detected the presence of a person in the garage. When arrested, he argued that he had been confused. Arkin's real objective was not robbery itself, but aggression, which includes robbery. The supreme objective was to cause harm, says Gonzalo Martinez Fresnida, criminal lawyer and prestigious criminologist. What happened does not correspond to the traditional burglary. Entering in that way, making enough noise to wake the woman, he called 112 for the first time at 4.14, and without worrying about her safety, is intended to make her presence evident. What is intended in these cases is to satisfy a brutal desire to punish a world that is the antithesis of their own. That home corresponds to the image of what he hates. Another police hypothesis is that Arkin knew about the house through a third party. The Castillos had hired services from the east, especially from the former Yugoslavia. In a case like this, the victim's environment is investigated, and that includes the domestic staff, it is something textbook, but that does not mean that anyone is suspected, the police say. Psychiatrist Luis Vega maintains that Arkin's actions are typical of a psychopath who knows what he is doing. The lack of emotional response after his arrest and his coldness is typical, doctors say, of a sociopathic personality disorder. disorder. Now he will try to appear crazier than he is to get out of jail, says Vega, Arkin is fully responsible for all of his actions, as he is aware of the damage he has caused. Arkin will be extradited to Romania when he completes his sentence in Spain. November 30, 2001 Petru Arkin has achieved his goal of not being handed over to Romania imminently, where he is charged with the crimes of homicide, robbery and trespassing. He will have to render an account to the justice of that country, but first he must be tried in Spain where he has numerous pending cases, the most serious being the murder of Arturo Castillo and the attack on his wife and daughters, 
which occurred on June 20th in the chalet where the family resided in Pozuelo. Avoid the prescription of crimes. The second criminal section of the national court agreed yesterday to declare the extradition of the Moldovan to Romania where he is claimed by the Statimer Prosecutor's Office, but it must be postponed until the extinction of the pending criminal responsibilities that the claimed has in Spain. Without prejudice to the possibility of temporary delivery to Romania, as established by the European Extradition Convention. According to this possibility, the Moldovan could be returned to Romania when he is already serving a sentence in Spain, he is currently in pretrial detention dash, there he would be tried so that the causes do not prescribe, he would return to our country to finish redeeming his sentence and finally he would be definitively extradited. On Monday Arkin appeared at the hearing that he had to decide whether or not he was extradited and, in his turn to speak, threatened to kill another person to avoid being handed over. According to the extradition request filed by the Romanian authorities, Arkin, on December 25, 2000, together with others, forced their way into the home of George Marius in Stadimer and beat him to death. He then took gold objects and mobile phones. The resolution favorable to the delivery of the national court is based on the fact that the requirements of double criminality are met, the facts for which he is accused in Romania are also crimes in Spain, that the minimum punitive penalty is met, the penalty to which he could be sentenced there exceeds one year in prison. That the facts have not prescribed, and that the claim is not due to political motivations. Arkin's defense argued that his client had never been in Romania, but the court understands that verification of this point does not correspond to the national court but to the Romanian court that judges him. Fair Trial in Romania Regarding the fact that Arkin will not have a fair trial in Romania, as his lawyer put forward to oppose the extradition, the chamber considers that this allegation is also without foundation since Romania is a signatory to the European Convention on Extradition and therefore this is obligated to the same extent as Spain. Arkin is accused in addition to homicide, injuries and robbery for the crime of Pozuelo, of numerous robberies in Colmena, Caslada, Alcorcon, Guadalajara and Toledo. The trial begins against Pietro Arkin and three other people for the Pozuelo crime. June 18, 2003 The Provincial Court of Madrid has begun this morning to prosecute the murder, in June 2001, of the lawyer Arturo Castillo during the assault on his chalet in the Madrid town of Pozuelo de Alarcón. For accused sit in the dock, the main suspect, Pietro Arkin, and three of his alleged collaborators. The oral hearing has begun with the reading of the party's qualification briefs. Arkin has listened to the accusation against him and when asked if he knew the terms of it, he has answered, answered, in the affirmative. Later, accompanied by a translator that he did not need, Arkin has said that he will only answer questions from his lawyer. The prosecutor requests 70 years in prison for Arkin as the author of 10 crimes, including murder, frustrated murder, attempted murder, illegal possession of weapons and injuries. For each of his three alleged collaborators, Julio Rodriguez, Manuel España, and Daniel Popa, he demands five years in prison. For its part, the private prosecution, exercised by the Castillo family, requests 80 years in prison for the main defendant for the crime of Pozuelo, while his defense pleads for his free acquittal, arguing that Arkin systematically denies the facts that were they accuse him. Furthermore, the lawyer has stated that we will also have to wait for the psychiatric reports. Provisional Prison Arkin, visibly thicker than when he was arrested, arrived at the Madrid court shortly before 9 o'clock in the morning aboard a police van from the Soto del Real Prison, where he has been provisionally detained since the June 20, 2001 dash. Precisely, the maximum period that he can be in preventive detention expires next Friday. Therefore, at the end of today's session, a hearing will be held in which the private prosecution will request the court to extend the preventive detention. The events in question occurred in the early morning of June 19 to 20, 2001. Pietro Arkin presumably entered the Castillo family chalet in Pozuelo de Alarcón. 
There he shot the lawyer Raul, Arturo, Castillo and his wife. Then he attacked the lawyer with a knife and beat him to death. He then attacked the couple's daughters. Arturo Castillo's wife managed to call 091 and 112 to ask for help. Arkin managed to flee the house, but was captured around 7 in the morning when he tried to escape the area. Arkin is a Moldovan national and is wanted by Romania for crimes of homicide, robbery and burglary. Cold, narcissistic and dangerous. June 19, 2003. The report prepared on Pietro Arkin by judicial psychologists Blanca Vasquez and Paz Ruiz leaves no doubt about his imputability. The diagnosis is that Arkin is a psychopath. But this does not mean that he is mentally disturbed, incapable of distinguishing between good and evil. On the contrary, he hurts others and is fully aware of it. He is extremely self-centered and insensitive, and incapable of connecting empathically or putting himself in another's shoes. Arkin inflicts pain on a similar person and in him, unlike a normal person, feelings of guilt do not surface, from which it is inferred that he has a high risk of recidivism. In the interview with the aforementioned psychologists, Arkin avoided talking about his family, his two brothers. Recently, he learned from a brother that his father, who lived in Moldova, had died. He dropped out of school at the age of 14 and was admitted to a center for people with rheumatic problems. He returned home at the age of 16 and for a time dedicated himself to being a tractor driver. Although his real profession has followed the path of crime, which he came to with only 12 years old, when he received his first conviction. He arrived in Spain at the age of 21, where he continued to commit crimes. In reality, he has committed crimes in the four European countries in which he was before entering Spain in 1999. He is a manipulator, observed the experts. Of his current stage in prison, he only says that he gets bored because they have him in an isolation cell. He says that he does not know why he is isolated, Arkin has gone so far as to say that he will kill again as soon as he can, although, sarcastically, he hypothesized to the experts, maybe it is because they are afraid of me. According to the report, Arkin is an insincere individual, pathological and superficial liar, who projects an overvalued and narcissistic image of himself. In his personality, he highlights his lack of remorse, remorse, and feelings of guilt before his misdeeds. And he is a cold and distant person who has great difficulty experiencing emotions. At any slightest frustration, he reacts violently. And regarding his sexual life, he states that he is unable to specify how many women he has had sexual relations with, although he calculates that with about 15 or 20. His life has developed outside the law and is dangerous, the report concludes. The three survivors of the Pozuelo crime recognize Arkin as the author of the murder. June 20, 2003 The three victims who survived the crime of the Pozuelo, in which the lawyer Arturo Castillo was murdered, have ratified their statements before the police and before the examining magistrate after the events occurred, in June 2001, as well as in the recognition of Arkin as the author of the crime, according to the witness's lawyer. Jose Enibol Alvarez Both the widow and the two daughters of the deceased lawyer, who were also attacked on the day of the events, testified before the court of the seventh section of the Provincial Court of Madrid, which is prosecuting the Moldovan and his three alleged collaborators in the crime, Julio Rodriguez Barrios, Manuel España and Daniel Popa. The witnesses appeared behind closed doors, without the presence of the public or the media, and protected from the defendants by a screen that prevented them from being seen. Throughout the day, the deponents, who entered the Madrid court through the building's garage in a maroon minivan with dark windows, were closely supported to prevent their images from being taken. From 10.30 a.m., and for a little less than two hours, the victims recalled, without being seen by their alleged attacker, everything that happened in the early morning of June 19-20, two years ago. 
Meanwhile, according to the informing sources, Arkin remained in the courtroom, with the same outfit that he wore on the first day of the trial, impassive and as if what he was hearing did not affect him in the slightest, the informing sources stated. Strong Statements The statements of the victims were moving, for them and for the rest of the people who occupied the courtroom, stated several of those present, but above all they were firm in relation to the night of the cars and the description of the incident. Individual who assaulted the chalet where the Castillo family lived, Alvarez said. In this sense, Gregorio Arroyo, representative of the widow and her two daughters for matters related to the right to privacy and the protection of her image, confirmed that the eldest of the sisters had made a thorough description of the person. That he entered his home, and that this explanation corresponded to the physical characteristics of Pietro Arkin. The young woman pointed out that the individual she saw that morning was a tall, corpulent, blonde, blue-eyed and athletic boy, features that matched the appearance of the Moldovan. Furthermore, after the event, the victims recognized the main accused as the author of the events. They have been very hard moments because they have had to remember minute by minute what happened. The three have been very emotional, but they have repeated the same thing as two years ago, explained the lawyer for the private prosecution. Who also recognized the exceptional treatment that his clients had received in the courtroom from the defense lawyers, who gave up asking questions to the witnesses. Only Arkin's legal representative asked several questions to Castillo's widow, who was the first to appear. Her youngest daughter followed, followed by her older sister. The protector of the privacy of the complainants indicated that they are still very affected by the event, since, he said, only two years have passed since then, and maintained that, although the psychological trauma still remains in them, with the trial, they have been able to remove an important weight. Physical Consequences in addition, of the psychological injuries that have been left to the three victims, the widow of Arturo Castillo has physical consequences as a result of the surgical interventions to which she had to be subjected to remove several internal organs. Since on the night of the events she received a shot with entry hole in a buttock and exit through the hip. As for the Moldovan, he reiterated that, while everyone present in the room was very affected by the story of the appearing parties, he appeared impassive, smiling at some moments, and was looking everywhere and making gestures. He has a flat affectivity, he has no remorse nor takes responsibility for it. His ego is very pronounced and he is capable of lying without caring about the consequences, added Arroyo, who added that he is a very dangerous individual in terms of his reintegration into society. In this sense, he specified that, although the private prosecution has not yet received official notification from the court, everything seems to indicate that the magistrates will extend for two more years the provisional prison situation of the Moldovan, held in an incommunicado cell at the penitentiary center. De Soto del Real since June 20, 2001. Precisely today is the deadline for Arkin's preventive arrest. Next Monday the trial will resume with the appearance of the national and municipal police officers who acted the night of the events in the chalet on Architecture Street and those who participated in the arrest of the main defendant. I could hear badly how he stabbed my husband after shooting us both. June 21, 2003 Exciting, firm and creepy. This is how those who witnessed it define the statement given yesterday by the widow and two daughters of the Pozuelo lawyer Arturo Castillo, murdered by the Moldovan Pietro Arkin, according to the prosecutor and the accusation. It was the second session of the trial being held in the Madrid court against him and his three alleged collaborators and it was a very special day, with dramatic overtones. It was two years since the lawyer's death and the attack of which his wife and his two daughters were victims. As they had requested, the three testified behind closed doors in a room without the public or the press and protected by a screen that served as a dividing line between the accused and the victims, as detailed to ABC by the prosecution's lawyer Jose Enibol Alvarez. In the center of the bench, dressed in the same clothes from the first day and exhibiting identical contempt, Arkin sat in the first row, 
oblivious to the pain and sadness that the words of his victims distilled. Those present assure that the Moldovan smiled on several occasions, coinciding even with the harshest fragments of the story of the events, in line with the profile drawn up by the psychologists included, total absence of remorse or feelings of guilt, cold and distant. The same day, two years later, Angela Sierra, the lawyer's wife, was the first to testify. I could hear badly hurt from the bed how she was slipping with the blood of my husband, who was dying while he told her, you deserve it, you bastard, dot. The room fell silent with the victim's tears, according to her lawyer, who was trying to cover the wound from which she was bleeding with her hand. Angelus was narrating the death of her husband, which the prosecutor includes with absolute precision in her description. The defendant, who already had Mr. Arturo at gunpoint, took aim and shot him quickly, injuring his lung, stomach and kidney, causing intense bleeding. He shot Ms. Angelus, the bullet entering the back of her left thigh and exiting through her right flank, after passing through her pelvic region, leaving her semi-conscious and motionless. As D. Arturo was still conscious, Arkin took out the machete and cut him down from behind her, wounding him with said weapon. He hit him forcefully with the handle of the machete or the butt of the revolver on the head, the autopsy revealed that his skull sank more than a centimeter, the victim was already unconscious, at which point Arkin stabbed him to ensure death. Quickly and accurately, twice in a row, he lost more than two liters of blood. Arkin left them both for dead and to make sure he approached the bed and removed the sheets, before attacking the couple's daughters. Angelus related the serious consequences that she suffers from, it took her 309 days to heal, she is still in psychological treatment, just like her daughters and assured that she lives in terror and has barred every last bit of her new house. She then declared herself the youngest of her two daughters. When she heard the first noises, she didn't care until she realized what was happening. She hid under her bed and from there her Moldovan dragged her out by her hair, while pointing a gun at her. He attacked her and her sister, who suffered a cut on the neck and after demanding that they tell him where the money, the jewelry, and the safe were, he assured that he was going to drink a wine from the collection that his wife kept. Mother. This detail, together with the fact that she asked the first girl about her sister, reveals that she had prior information from the family, an issue that has not been clarified, a Romanian assistant has not been located to date. Her sister, always according to the lawyer, left the court stunned. She reviewed what happened in the early hours of June 20th, coldly and in every detail, without any inaccuracy or contradiction with respect to her previous statements. After attacking the two daughters, Arkin returned to the couple's bedroom. Angelus, who kept calling 112, had to hide the phone with her body so that she wouldn't discover it. She believed they were the last seconds of her life. Arkin was arrested when he was wearing a medal from one of Castillo's daughters. June 25, 2003 The municipal police who arrested the Moldovan Pietro Arkin after the Pozuelo crime, which cost the life of lawyer Arturo Castillo and in which his wife and two daughters were injured, found on the top part of the tracksuit that he was wearing a medal with the name of one of the victims who survived the assault. In addition, two mobile phones were seized, one of which did not belong to him, and 110 euros. The two policemen who arrested Arkin at dawn on June 20, 2001 testified yesterday before the court of the 7th section of the Provincial Court of Madrid that is prosecuting the facts. The first agent who entered the room of the lawyer and his wife also appeared. The municipal officials reported that in the early morning of the events, after being alerted by the police station of the existence of a shooting in the vicinity of the Hypercore in Pozuelo de Alarcón, they headed towards the place. On the way, they were notified of the escape of a suspect from the robbed chalet. The information alerted them that an individual, 1.80 meters tall, young, corpulent and with blonde hair, had entered a construction area, open, with many nooks and crannies and where it was easy to hide. After searching the area, the agents searched the area of the Pozuelo rent station and, finding no trace of the suspect, 
they headed to the Elberschel station. Shortly before arriving at this enclave, between Penalara Street and the M-40, the municipal officers came across a man whose physical characteristics corresponded to those provided by the station. Persecution Seeing that the police were approaching him, the individual fled and crossed all the lanes of the aforementioned ring road. The suspect headed towards the place known as the Bridge of Lights, where he was cornered by the police, who stood on both sides of the structure. When he saw us, he left the top part of his tracksuit on the bridge, took out his mobile phone and started talking on it, as if it were nothing to him, explained one of the witnesses. But even though they stopped him, the individual continued walking until they were at his level and asked him to relent in his attitude. At that moment, he knelt on the ground, the two indicated. The Moldovan identified himself as Igor Dumitrescu and, not at all nervous and with a very cold attitude, he did not want to say anything else, even though he spoke and understood Spanish. Arkin was taken to the police station, where the national agent who arrived at the Castillo family's home in the first instance and who surprised the detainee jumping the fence of the house recognized him as the person who had shot him. According to yesterday's witnesses, the companion, visibly nervous and agitated, said before the impassive gaze of Pietro Arkin, it was you, it was you. The police found traces of the lawyer Castillo's blood on Pietro Arkin's clothes. June 26, 2003. There was the victim's blood on Pietro Arkin's clothes. In the early hours of June 19 to 20, 2001, the Moldovan and three other men allegedly assaulted the chalet of lawyer Arturo Castillo in Pozuelo de Alarcón, shot him, slit his throat, and attacked his wife and two daughters. Yesterday, during the fifth session of the trial being held in the provincial court against Arkin and his collaborators, two scientific police agents who investigated the case explained their conclusions. The experts said that they found traces of the lawyer's blood and that of one of his daughters on the clothes that the accused was wearing. They also indicated that traces of lawyer Arturo Castillo's DNA were found on a sheet, on a machete with which he was allegedly slit, on Arkin's tracksuit jacket, on the deceased's nails and on a Rolex watch. Police reports also indicate that there were biological remains of one of the couple's daughters on sheets, in a pillowcase, on the floor of her room and in a nightgown, presumably the one she was wearing on the night of the crime. Blood stains from the youngest of Castillo's daughters were also found on the underwear of Pietro Arkin, who was arrested a few hours later. Gunpowder in a hand Several agents from the ballistics unit of the National Police also appeared yesterday who revealed the discovery of traces of gunpowder in the left hand of the Moldovan. According to their analysis, the Moldovan's left hand had shot particles. The lawyer for the private prosecution asked the investigators if that would mean that the shooter used the weapon with his left hand. The agents responded that the tests could lead to this conclusion, although only theoretically, since, as they said, in practice there could be numerous situations in which gunpowder particles were transferred from one hand to another. However, and when asked by Pietro Arkin's defense, the agents concluded that, just because a person has gunpowder residue does not mean that he is automatically the author of a shot, but rather that he was close to the detonation. Regarding the analysis of the mechanics of the shots, the ballistics experts indicated that the detonations were carried out with a conventional Magnum 357 revolver, in good working order and equipped with six bullets, of which five casings were found outside the weapon and a cartridge inside it. Two of these bullets hit Castillo's body, piercing his hand and chest. In the opinion of the police, the chest wound had to be fatal, since, as they stated, the revolver with which it occurred has a lot of power and used at close range is lethal. Many lies have been told in the trial, declares the prisoner. June 27, 2003 At the end of the trial that took place for almost a week in the court, the court asked Pietro Arkin if he wanted to say anything before ending the hearing. The Moldovan was brief, many lies have been told. The other defendants, Manuel Espana, Daniel Popa and Julio Rodriguez, asked for forgiveness. 
Arkin also addressed one of the lawyers of the murdered lawyer's family, Gregorio Arroyo, and told him that if he didn't like his look or his laugh, he shouldn't go around talking about him. Arroyo explained in this regard, Arkin must have seen me on television when I commented before the cameras that he had seen him smiling at the trial. Arkin's lawyer requested the free acquittal of his client, although he indicated that, in case of conviction, and defense of personality disorder would be applied. At the oral hearing, Arkin denied his participation in the events, as did the other three defendants, although Julio and Manuel acknowledged having taken Arkin that night in a vehicle to Pozuelo. Pietro Arkin, the perpetrator of the Pozuelo crime, sentenced to 75 years in prison. July 28, 2003 The Provincial Court of Madrid has sentenced Pietro Arkin to 75 years in prison, the Moldovan who in June 2001 entered the home of lawyer Arturo Castillo in Pozuelo de Alarcón, Madrid, murdered the lawyer, tried to kill his wife and assaulted him. To the two daughters of the marriage. He also robbed the house and tried to kill a police officer while fleeing from him. The chamber considers that Arkin, 25 years old, is the author of the crimes of murder, attempted murder, attack, attempted homicide, assault, mental injuries, illicit possession of weapons, robbery with violence and intimidation and use of a weapon in competition with home invasion. On the other hand, the court has acquitted Daniel Popa, who was considered one of the alleged collaborators of the murderer. The Castillo family's lawyer has announced that he will appeal this court decision, according to Cadena S.R. Two other people accused of collaborating with Arkin have been convicted. These are Manuel España and Julio Rodríguez Barrios, who are considered necessary collaborators of the perpetrator of the crime in the crimes of robbery and home invasion. Spain has been sentenced to two years and six months and Rodríguez Barrios to four years. During the trial, which was held between June 18 and 26, the prosecutor requested for Arkin the 75 years in prison to which he has been sentenced, while the private prosecution demanded 80 years of arrest for the Moldovan. The defendant has been held in preventive custody in the Soto del Real prison since the events occurred. Tragic Night The court of the seventh section of the Madrid High Court that has prosecuted the facts considers it proven that in the early hours of June 19 to 20, 2001, Pietro Arkin entered through the window on the top floor of the chalet inhabited by the Castillo family and, once inside, he shot the lawyer and his wife. After ending the life of the lawyer, whom he also hit on the head and stabbed to ensure his death, he left the lawyer's wife to die and went to the rooms where the couple's daughter slept. Arkin attacked both of them, locked them in a closet and, noticing the arrival of the police, who had been alerted by Arturo Castillo's wife, he fled the place. The ruling also considers it accredited that in his flight the Moldovan shot, with the clear intention of ending his life, an agent who was chasing him. And that he also stole various objects belonging to the Castillo family from the house. Maximum security in the transfer of Pietro Arkin from prison to San Durida. August 27, 2008. The National Police released yesterday morning and transferred to the Palma Hospital of San Durida one of the most dangerous inmates of the Palma prison, Pietro Arkin, known as the Pizuelo murderer, under intense security measures. The inmate, about 30 years old and of Moldovan origin, was guarded at all times by agents of the Prevention and Reaction Unit UPR, of the National Police Corps. Arkin left prison early in the morning for a medical visit to a specialist. Hours later, he was returned to jail. The assassin of Pozuelo, who has been imprisoned in Palma for about two years, is serving a 75-year prison sentence for assaulting the villa of lawyer Arturo Castillo in Pozuelo de Alarcón, Madrid, in the summer of 2001, where he murdered the lawyer, he tried to kill his wife and attacked the couple's two daughters. Internal FIES the man is considered a dangerous and very aggressive criminal, for which he is a FIES prisoner, file of special monitoring inmates. Furthermore, forensic doctors branded him during his trial in 2003 as a book psychopath for whom human life has no meaning. For this reason, 
extreme security measures are taken in all his transfers. In recent months Pietro Arkin has been released on at least three other occasions to go to the doctor at the Carmen Outpatient Clinic, in the center of Palma, since he apparently suffers from some ailment in the digestive system. As this is a criminal considered extremely dangerous, these visits are always carried out with great security measures. Yesterday at 9 in the morning he was examined by a doctor from another specialty at the San Dorita Hospital. He was subsequently taken back to the prison without any incident. The UPR policemen were in charge of watching him. The crime in Pozuelo occurred on June 20, 2001 at dawn when Arkin entered the villa of the lawyer Arturo Castillo with the intention of stealing. Immediately afterwards, he went to the couple's bedroom and fired at them. Seeing that the lawyer was dying, the Moldovan hit his head with the butt of the revolver and with the handle of a machete, which he used to finish him off with a stab wound to the chest. Arkin believed that the couple had already died and went to the rooms of the two daughters whom he attacked. Then he locked them in a closet. The lawyer's wife, who was badly injured, alerted the police. Pietro Arkin, the soulless murderer. September 23, 2012. In this new entry from Crimini Criminologist, the graduate in Information Sciences and graduate in Higher Criminology, Christina Amanda Turbernat, sends us a fragment of one of her magnificent books, Seven Perverse Minds, in which she analyzes the figure of the murderer who shocked, in the early morning of June 20, 2001. To the inhabitants of Pozuelo de Alarcón, Madrid. Cristina Amanda Tur is also notable for books such as Crimes in Ibiza and Formentera in the 20th Century, Chronicle of Events, Anti-Drug Operation. And hers are two detective novels, The Devil in the Details, The Suicidal Angel and The Sicilian Song. A good example of a psychopathic killer is Pietro Arcan Petro, born in Mongova, Moldova, is the beast. The three photographs from his mugshot, released after the murder of lawyer Arturo Castillo, in June 2001, are unforgettable. Arkin, in a black vest and sharp features, looks anything but scared or worried. He has short, light military hair, wide-set eyes, and ears set off from his sharp face. There is nothing special about him, really, but the majority of readers who in those days examined his gaze on the front pages of the newspapers honored Lombroso's memory and commented that the man had the look of a murderer, the eyes of a demon. That the features of his eastern face showed the evil of his soul. The theories of Cesare Lombroso, father of positivism, are supposed to be outdated, but society continues to try to see evil in the faces of men. The beast, human showed his condition at dawn on June 20, 2001, in Pozuelo de Alarcón. It is 3.45 in the morning when Pietro jumps over the two-meter fence that surrounds the chalet of lawyer Arturo Castillo and his family. He enters the house through the attic terrace. He knows for a fact that there is money in the house and he is tired of stealing and reselling mobile phones for 5,000 pesetas. Arturo, his wife and his two daughters, ages 15 and 17, sleep in his rooms. He arrives at the marriage bedroom and enters. He does not turn on the light and carries in his hand a Colt King Cobra revolver, an exceptional weapon that no one can admire tonight. Pietro, of course, does not have a license. Arthur has heard a noise. The lawyer sees his attacker in the shadows and raises his left hand in an innocent gesture of protection. The bullet passes through his palm, exits through his back and enters his chest at a place a little below the heart until it lodges in the right kidney cell. Another bullet is destined for Angelus. The damage she causes is terrible and she remains semi-conscious while her husband's life escapes her. Pietro realizes that Arturo is alive and approaches him with a machete in his hand. And in this first scene there are already several points of interest. First of all, we must not lose sight of the fact that this is a theft. Arkin searches for money, jewelry or anything of value, but he gains nothing from the deaths of the house's tenants. 
and absolutely nothing during the entire development of the investigation and the process indicates that the Moldovan wanted to kill the lawyer for revenge or for any other reason. Nothing. He just kills him to get him out of the way. The goal, in any case, is not aggression but robbery. Secondly, it is curious that Arkin uses two weapons in the same murder sequence. It is not common, and it would be very interesting to know what mechanism prompted him to change the luxury revolver for a machete, but the truth is that it can only be speculated. Perhaps the explanation is as simple as he didn't want to waste two bullets on the same victim, he knew his reserve was limited and more trouble could arise, or he wanted to make as little noise as possible. It's the simplest, and the simplest explanation is usually the right one, as Occam's razor reminds us. In any case, a change from a weapon that does not involve contact between the aggressor and victim, such as a revolver, to a contact weapon may mean that the murderer, after starting the sequence, wanted to experience the death of the victim with a greater intensity and that is achieved by staining blood. The murderer goes up a notch in his aggressiveness and prefers the knife. On the other hand, the injuries he inflicts with the second weapon may seem unnecessary if the intent is to kill the man. Curiously, he hits him with the handle, or the butt of the revolver, on the head, so hard that it sinks his occipital bone and, finally, stabs him accurately in twice in the chest. Pietro Arkin is in a hurry. His objective is to plunder the house, not to be forgotten, so he has to dispatch the obstacles quickly. Actually, he's not really interested in causing damage, he just doesn't care. It doesn't matter. So sad. He acts in a process that experts usually call homicidal rage, a more or less long sequence in which the aggressor does not hesitate to kill viciously, in which the aggressor is inflamed by his actions and one follows the other. The different types of injuries, which surprise the forensic doctors, and the weapons used are related to this point. The lawyer has injuries from a knife, a firearm and bruises probably produced with the butt of the revolver. A spiral of violence. Arkin believes that the woman is dead as well, although she will survive, and goes to the daughter's rooms, machete in hand. And, to make a long story short, because here it is not necessary to dwell on the details of the attack, the two girls are beaten, one of them is sexually assaulted, and they end up locked in a closet. Meanwhile, the mother manages to contact the emergency services. At a quarter to five in the morning, the murderer leaves the house with 19,000 pesetas, a mobile phone and a few pieces of jewelry. A police officer sees the fence jump and shouts, stop. Police. But, after a chase, he manages to get away. Shortly after 6 in the morning, he is arrested near a gas station, where his cronies have to pick him up. That night Pietro Arkin becomes the monster of all nightmares. But it is not one of those cases where, suddenly, a normal man becomes a criminal. The monster was not born yesterday. He was born in Moldova on October 9, 1977. He grew up in orphanages in Chisna, the capital, and lived through the clashes between the civilian population and the Soviet army in 1989 and the proclamation of independence in 91. Arkin is cannon fodder, another boy more devoted to the streets. Independence caught him at the age of 14, at a time when many of the inhabitants of turbulent Moldova decided to look for El Dorado outside its borders. Arkin goes to Germany, but life there is not easy either and, in the end, he chooses the destination that many Romanians preferred in the 90s, Spain. In 1994, he arrived in Madrid. He doesn't even bother looking for the papers that make him a legal citizen, and every time a police officer asks for his name, he gives a different one and invents a new address. Arkin entered Spain illegally six years ago to earn a living by stealing from houses and chalets in Madrid. Why would he need papers? On May 15, 1999, he was arrested for the first time for stealing a motorcycle. 
Already then he opens an expulsion file that seems to add to mountains of similar papers. His career is unstoppable, after all, if they arrest him, he spends a few days in jail, they give him free food, they let him go and start over and on September 22nd he is arrested in Kuslada for a robbery with force. He was then blamed for another robbery committed in the same town two weeks earlier. On October 6th, he is arrested for robbery with force in Guadalajara. On March 10, 2000, he was arrested for another robbery in Caslada and on May 10 for robbery with intimidation, also in Caslada. A little less than four months before the crime in Pozuelo, he is arrested in Brejega, Guadalajara, and the authorities try to apply the then recent immigration law to expel him from the country without any more nonsense, with the previous one, the commission of a crime stopped that possibility. But the judge in Caslada, with whom he continues to have a pending case, refuses to expel him from the country without taking account, so the judge in the Brejega case puts him on the street. He has never been tried and walks through the streets of Madrid without papers and without work. And this CV is just what is known, probably the tip of an iceberg. He gives false names and addresses, he never gets summonses, so he never goes to court. Justice is too often effective, dropping time bombs onto the streets without knowing how to deactivate them or when they are going to be triggered. Pietro specializes in entering houses that he first watches and breaking windows to steal the latest models of mobile phones. On the streets of Moldova he learned to open car doors and uses his method to find a way to escape. He usually finds some unfortunate person to accompany him and waits for him at the door practically with the engine running. However, property crimes are not everything. In the month of April, two months before the Pozuelo crime, Interpol issued an international search and arrest warrant issued by the Romanian authorities for murder, robbery and trespassing. A court in Sadamere, Romania. 654 kilometers north of Bucharest, is looking for him because on Christmas night in 2000, Arkin and an occasional accomplice entered the house of a certain Gheorghe Marius and beat him to death, about 30 times, with a stake of the kind they use in those parts to kill large fish. They opened her head, it seems that it was Arkin, specifically, and left her wife badly injured and her parents and a small poodle beaten. The Doberman, however, was only drugged. They took more than $7,000, 2,000 German marks and 100,000 forints. George Marius had a small but profitable business selling passports from European Union countries. Apparently, the documents he sold to another mobster named Avidu were so bad that they soon landed him in prison, where he found the right person, Arkin, to exact his revenge. In the international arrest warrant for extradition, the Romanian police points to the Spanish the possibility that his suspect has returned to Spain. In fact, Pietro Arkin lives in Caslada with several Romanians and says that he has worked for the Russian Mafia and that he has even killed for it. Whenever he has the opportunity, he wears a suit, jewelry and a stolen watch. His Mafia story will thus seem more credible. He likes guns, and a Colt King Cobra 357 Magnum is not just anything. After the chapter on Pozuelo de Alarcón, he enters the dungeons and only opens his mouth to ask for blonde tobacco. This is, in broad but significant strokes, Pietro Arkin Pietro. During the investigation it is discovered that a Polish friend of Pietro was fired from the lawyer's house and later told the Moldovan that there was pasta, jewelry, and good wines there. Three other individuals are arrested for participating in the robbery of Arturo Castillo's home, two of them took Arkin to the house by car. On June 18, 2003, he was transferred to the Provincial Court of Madrid to be tried. He denies being the murderer. He denies having been in the house, but the evidence is inescapable. To begin with, the victims identify him without hesitation. They recognized him after the crime and during the trial, although the three women testified behind a screen and his lawyer requested that this part of the oral hearing be held behind closed doors and there was no objection. 
Regarding the attitude of the accused in the face of the vivid statements of a woman who saw her husband die and that she was about to follow his destiny, and of two others who were attacked, locked in a closet while their father died, the lawyer assures that Pietro Arkin did not show any change in his cold expression. Unlike the other three defendants, who could not help but feel moved and uncomfortable to a greater or lesser extent. That flat affectivity that the defendant shows in the face of a story to which the normal population would at least lower their gaze may seem like a cliché, but it is just one more detail that shows a certain personality common to an excessively high number of criminals, although not so many. As could be interpreted from the newspaper chronicles. These impassive criminals include the group of psychopaths. In fact, everything indicated so far leads us to think that Pietro Arcan Petro is one. At this point, we must refer to the psychiatric and psychological reports that the prosecutor describes as conclusive. And they must be, because the sentence dispatches them in a page and a half. A medical examiner's first report describes his interview with the defendant. Some traits of his personality emerge in the speech but more than in what he says, in how he says it. Thus, for example, the entire interview is a demonstration of egocentrism, a lack of distress in the face of events that he does not recognize and in which he denies any participation. Acts of which he claims to have knowledge and assumes that they are barbaric, but that recognition does not carry any emotional connotation, he intellectualizes them rationally, coldly. That is, the subject affirms that he is in prison for events in which he denies any participation, however the effective incongruity and emotional distancing are striking. The interview with the defendant is impressive because of his coldness, because of his unwavering absence of emotional connotations, not even minimal, of the content of the speech that he recounts. One issue stands out. He says what a normal person is expected to say in the face of despicable facts, he assumes they are barbaric, but that does not mean that he feels them. He imitates the feelings but doesn't have them. Arkin, initially suspicious, ends up participating in the interview and tells the doctor that years ago he suffered very severe head trauma, strong blows, although there are no signs or scars of any kind. He explains that there is no history of mental illness in his family, that he knows of, of course, and he defines himself as a heavy consumer of alcohol, preferably rum, for many years. The forensic doctor subjects him to a basic test to determine his abilities, the Folstein Mini Mental, and his score is normal, he does not find the slightest indication of cognitive impairment. He could be considered a normal person, with normal understanding abilities, but each of the paragraphs of the four-page report defines the psychopath, of course he knows the rules and differentiates what is right from what is wrong, but his hierarchical scale puts your interests before any other consideration, that is to say, the rules exist. But he does not feel that such a statement affects him personally. The most interesting thing about the report is perhaps how it settles the question of the responsibility of the psychopath, Pietro Arkin brings together the personality and behavioral traits described by Cleckley for psychopathic personalities, but this should in no case be interpreted as a diagnosis, but as a way of being. This is Pietro Arkin Pietro. Those who know him say that he has no soul. It's the popular way of expressing it. He is, in truth, the paradigm of the criminal who seems to lack any feeling that allows him to live in society without representing a danger to his fellow human beings. But this case has something special, because it shows that psychopathic criminals are not only those murderers who commit the most absurd, most gratuitous, most inexplicable crimes, those who simply attack strangers on the streets. Criminals of this type can be thieves, robbers, vengeful murderers, murderers of their wives depending on their objectives. Basic equality is that everyone moves according to their own needs and pleasures, but they are differentiated by what pleases them. Arkin wanted items and money. In fact, the most purest classifications would not admit Pietro Arkin as a serial killer even if one more were added to the crimes of Sutter Mare and Pozuelo, 
at least three victims are needed to be considered a serial killer, although the attempted murder of the lawyer's wife or the wife of the passport forger could also be counted. They would not admit it, simply, because his motive is economic profit. In reality, motivations are not that important in classification. The fact that it is more difficult for us to understand that a person is killed out of boredom or pleasure than for money does not mean that there is that much difference. Furthermore, Arkin's case is complex in terms of motivations, because he did not need to commit the crime to achieve his goals, so he did not just do it for money. Pietro Arkin Petro was sentenced, in July 2003, to 75 years in prison and to pay compensation of 760,000 euros to the family of the murdered lawyer. The 75 years are a sum of sentences for murder, attempted murder, attempted murder in ideal competition with the crime of attack for shooting at a police officer, sexual assault, injuries, illicit possession of weapons and home invasion as a means to commit robbery with violence and intimidation. A whole variety of crimes in a single case. The case of Pietro Arkin offers a complex and multifaceted view of criminality and psychopathy. Although psychopaths may traditionally be thought of as serial killers with no apparent motive beyond pleasure or boredom, Arkin breaks that mold. His main motivation was economic, which calls into question prejudices about what drives a criminal of this type. Furthermore, his wide variety of crimes, from murder and attempted murder to sexual assault, battery, and illegal weapons possession, demonstrates that psychopathy does not always manifest itself in just one way. Arkin's actions were guided by his own needs and pleasures, regardless of the repercussions for others, which puts him in the realm of psychopathic criminals even though he is not a serial killer in the strictest sense of the term. His sentence to 75 years in prison and the significant financial compensation imposed on him reflect the seriousness and complexity of his crimes. The case serves as a troubling reminder that criminality and psychopathy can take many forms and do not always fit the simplistic stereotypes we might hold. Ultimately, the case of Pietro Arkin sheds light on the need for a more nuanced and comprehensive understanding of what makes certain individuals become extreme criminals, beyond simplistic categories and labels. As society continues to search for ways to understand and treat criminals and psychopaths, cases like Arkin's can offer valuable, if deeply disturbing, insights. Well, dear listeners, we have reached the end of this episode, in which we explore the intriguing and complex case of Pietro Arkin. We hope that this in-depth analysis has offered you a new perspective on psychopathy and the world of criminology. If you liked this episode, we sincerely appreciate you giving it a like and subscribing to our channel. Every like and every subscription really makes a difference for us, and allows us to continue offering content that contributes to the understanding of these complex topics. Also, we would love to hear your opinions and comments, so feel free to leave them below. Do you have any questions or a case you'd like us to address in future episodes? Your feedback is gold for us. From the entire Criminotica team, we send you a big hug and thank you for being part of our growing community. Until the next episode, take care of yourselves.